All right, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, tonight, uh, Sean Coughlin will talk about From Ohio to Alabama, the journey of a working archaeologist. A little bit about Sean. At the age of 15, he spent two weeks on a field school with the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. Since then, he has been active in archaeology in some capacity for close to 40 years. He continued to work with the Cleveland Museum of Natural History during high school and while getting his bachelor's degree in anthropology from Kent State University. He went immediately into graduate school at the University of Tennessee, where he specialized in zooarchaeology and rounded out his knowledge of historical archaeology. He received his master's degree at the University of Tennessee and then went on to work in cultural resources, resources management. Because of his past experiences, he was often put on projects that were more unusual than others. He is, and that's saying something for archaeology. He has worked <laughs> all over the south, uh, southeast and midwestern U.S., as far west as Texas and Oklahoma, and as far north as Wisconsin. His presentation will highlight his beginnings in archaeology and some of the more unique projects in which he has participated. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. Um, I'll call for all of them because that would take a couple of days. <laughs> but we'll get started. So I am originally from a little town called Berea, outside of Cleveland, Ohio. It's right here. Home of the Cleveland Browns, where their, their offices are. Um, Part of my interest in the past comes from my grandparents and this farmhouse. This farmhouse was built by the family in 1881. My grandparents sold it in 1978. It was full of a lot of old stuff. Mm -hmm. um, one minor segue, we recently donated three letters written by James A. Garfield before he was president to my great, great, great grandfather. Um, in the house were also eight boxes of general correspondence, including the abolitionists. And apparently my great great grandfather had a long correspondence with James Garfield. There's a book of letters of Garfield's published during his Civil War time. This is one of those letters that he wrote back uh, to my great grandfather at that time. Um, so a lot of old stuff in the family, just in the past. Also because of the farm, and interested in nature and outdoors. And in junior high, I was really a nerd. <laughs> and I was a member of a junior high geology club. We went fossil hunting. Um, and I actually got involved in showing gems and minerals and different mineral shows around the country. I even got first place in one. Um, but we went from Cleveland to Detroit. Wisconsin, Houston, uh, New York. In a Chicago show in Wheaton, Illinois, I saw an exhibit on Cahokia that I thought was really cool. Um, so yeah, I was already doing weird things. And because of this, I was showing one inch minerals. That if you're showing minerals that have to fit in a one by one inch cube, I got involved in micro minerals, minerals that can only be viewed under a microscope. And the Cleveland Museum of Natural History had a micro mineral society. And we joined. And in May of 1983, we got a flyer from the museum that said, hey, come out and dig on a real archaeological site for two weeks. Somehow I convinced my parents to let me go. Dad was going across town, he had his parents' house that year summer. He dropped me off at the site every day, and I spent two weeks at the age of 15 at the Greenwood Village site. Greenwood Village site is a semi-enclosed plateau overlooking the Cuyahoga River Valley. Um, discovered in 1871 or written in about 1871 by Charles Wilsey. Um, the National Park acquired this property um, and they were doing some evaluation of some of the sites on their property and the museum was did two field seasons there and I was part of both. Um, 
The first season, I learned one of the main aphorisms of archaeology. There's a large pot in the site. You're going to put a stake right in the middle of it and have to open four test units because of that. Um, the Greenwood Village site is a late middle woodland or early late woodland site, a hilltop enclosure. When these sites were first found, like Fort H in southern Ohio, they were often thought of as forts or some kind of military protection structures. And our work here really showed that this was more of a more ceremonial or specific function. It didn't have a lot of habitation stuff added, had very few features or very few, very less debris. This is one of the biggest features on the site. One of the other things I spent my second summer on was a 13 meter long trench uncovering a rock granite. Probably not the most exciting. Because <laughs> um, it's northern Ohio, a lot of glacial till. So they had moved a ramp of glacial till up to the ditch embankment surrounding it. Part of the reason we don't believe it is fortification is because on the back side of all of these is where they took the dirt to pile up to make the mounds. So you've got a low spot on the downside, the back side, which is in terms of defense, not very sensible. But this was my introduction to archaeology. I was kind of hooked. I was growing into my feet. I often tripped across things going across the site. But uh, in 94, 84, I had already done four weeks at Greenwood Village. And my grandparents decided to send me on a church trip to the Middle East. I was 16 and the only unaccompanied teenager on the thing, but went to Petra before it appeared in 1989's version of Indiana Jones. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, which one was that? It's the one with all the gray. Um, Raiders. No, Raiders is the first one. This is oh yeah, the whole year. That's the arc. Um, but I think a lot of people thought it's going to be a biblical archaeology now. And I was like, no way. <laughs> it's just too much stuff going on there. <laughs> stuff everywhere. I couldn't walk places and not see artifacts on the ground, and it just made me itchy because North American archaeology, you don't. <laughs> Throw stuff out to get to stuff you're interested in. You've got to document it all. <laughs> it felt wrong. So I continued with the museum while I was in high school. We worked at the Stas site. There's a little site also in the Cuyahoga Valley. This is me doing my best uh, Corps of Engineers hydrology skills. Um, was digging a hole in this hole to drain the water out of our excavation units. Um, I was young. And um, yeah. <laughs> Stas site was uh, an interesting site, late woodland. A lot of features, very small, very shallow. And then one day we found one really big one. Bizarre. Uh, Stas was important to me because it's where we first found a lot of fauna remains. And I got interested in understanding, to me, food is always a good sign of understanding of culture. So this is one of the sites that set me on the path to become a archaeologist. Mall A was another project I did with the museum. This was probably while I was at Kent State. And I'll talk more about that in a bit. Mall A was a the Jacobs brothers who built the Cleveland Indian Stadium at the time. Did a project downtown Cleveland before they built the stadium. And this was Mall A, it was a parking garage. And it was on top of a upper class neighborhood, John Case of Case Western Reserve. His backyard was in the project area. Uh, so this is where I really got my teeth in historic archaeology. But it's also where I had my first looting experience. We ran a project every week, Monday through Friday with a field school. Saturday we had volunteers out. Sunday we were out of the field. Monday morning we came back and everything had been chunked out that we had excavated. Um, and you can see vandalism. Um, that was one of the first, you know, this is a screen on the ground with dirt thrown on it and stuff. It, 
the, the vandals were looking for bottles and jugs. In fact, right next to one of the holes they looted was a whole whiskey jug with a minor chip in the handle. That they found. Uh, but because it was an upper class neighborhood, there was a lot of, oh, we chipped it, like put it in the prison or in the cistern. And I did go to Kent State University right down the road. It allowed me to continue my relationship with the museum. Um, and I worked with Mark Seaman while I was there. Also, being in college, I got flyers for, hey, come do archaeology places. So I got my first out-of-state CRM job in 1987. Was there again in 88. And I worked on a highway project in Illinois. Um, and one of the first big sites we did was a prehistoric site, Middle Archaic. We opened up a 13 meter wide block because the field director decided it was a the first Middle Archaic roundhouse. We had a few posts and then followed, found an ark. And then one day we cut all the posts because she'd been cutting it through the end. And there was no house. But we had a really nice lean to with a good pile of chipping debris. Um, also that summer, I got to play in really deep trenches. Um, this is a kettle site, so it's a glacial kettle in the north. When the glaciers were treated, a block, a large block of ice would fall off the glacier. It would cause a, to form a landscape, it would cause a depression and it would fill with water. That would be a natural pond for many years. Often these kettles were later tiled out and drained so that they could be farmed. Um, but this column you see is the basically the layers of shell and phytoliths and other things at the bottom of this pond um, during this period. In fact, right behind me here is a tree that had fallen flat and was part of the pond bottom. Um, in terms of environmental reconstruction, the people running the project wanted to send these some samples off for snail analysis. And their snail analyst in Washington State said, hey, did you send me a meter block of dirt? So we cut a really big trench. It's pedestal a meter by meter block of this stuff. And we cut a meter by meter by meter block off. We had a board, a rope, slid everything under. We walked it up out of the trench, got it in a truck, wrapped it with plastic. They got it to the train station, put it on a train to Washington, and they said, sorry, it's too heavy. They had to cut it under my <laughs> But this was really cool. In fact, during this part of the process, the second summer, I got to excavate my first piece of extinct megafauna. There was a stag moose along one edge of the kettle. And along with uh, the paleontologist, archaeologist at Illinois State Museum, I got to excavate the ulna of a stag moose and had to put the plaster jacket on it and everything. So this is while I was at Kent during my summers. There was also the fun part of archaeology. The Archway Cookie Company was on the road to the site every day. <laughs> and one day we had to stop and take a tour and get samples. <laughs> <laughs> this gentleman here, well, guy in the, the blonde here, he actually taught me the Flint map that first time. That's where I learned Flint mapping from. He was from Cahokia and picked up a skill there. And we used to sit out. They rented two houses in this little town of 1,100 people. And we used to sit out next to the garage and Flint map whenever we could. Next to him, standing up in the glasses, is Brett Ruby. Brett is the head archaeologist now at Hopewell Culture National Historic Site, Chill Coffee, Ohio. Um, Brett and I overlapped at Kent. He was there for his senior year. I was there for my freshman year. Got to be more friends during this project. And I've done some work for him since that I'll talk about later. While I was at Kent, I need some credit hours. And so I did a field school. I, we didn't find very much. But one day it rained, and I never really understood quite why we were here. But the farm was owned by a guy named Robert Harness. He took us down to his basement when it rained, and it was wall-to-wall -wall showcases. 
And those are all projectile points. Uh, Bob had been surface collecting his farm for 30 years. And each of these points was labeled with letters or numbers. And he was, unlike a lot of other collectors that put it all in a big pile, he actually had his farm divided into 45 different locations. Each artifact, if it was in a showcase, was labeled. He had cigar boxes of artifacts from those fields as well that went with this. And I, 1,500 acre farm, it included bottom land on the side of the river, it included raised terraces overlooking both the bottom and the back terrace, and the terrace sites. He also had a Hopewell earthwork on his property, an Adina mound, and a couple other sites that had been excavated previously. Um, so I left his basement and his living room, because this was his coffee table. Um, and I told my advisor, I had Mark Seaman, I had a undergraduate thesis option as an honor student. I said, I wanted to document his collection for my undergraduate thesis. So I took an extra year and looked at 19,000 artifacts from 45 locations on the property. Um, and I learned a lot. Saw a lot of different church types, saw a lot of different point types. There were 5,000 projectile points, 3,000 of which we typed. Um, there were mica cutouts because they had well earthworks. There were Knife River churn in some places, again, because of the Hopewell stuff. So it was a really big learning experience. There was a woman I worked for later who I knew from all of this time, and she later told some of her staff that I'd looked at more artifacts than they had in their lifetimes because of this. Um, but that was one of those projects that started me off in the, I've been doing field work this whole time, but archaeology is also right. Can I write? I wrote something, it wasn't great, but I thought I could do this. One of my last projects with the Cleveland Museum of Natural History before I left Ohio to go to Tennessee for grad school was paleo crossings. Um, those are all parts of Clovis Poles. Um, in 1991, a landowner was trying to stop, no, the renter of the landowner was trying to stop the development. He was an artist. He had rented this farm with a barn and he made these humongous natural wood tabletops. He'd take huge sections out of a tree, sand it, shellac it, just beautiful stuff. But somebody was ready to make a development right there. He didn't want it because he liked his workspace. So he went out to the field and started finding me. Um, so that last summer we did controlled surface collection, found something like 17 Clovis points, excavations, potentially at Clovis house or post mold, which I think has since been debunked by Matt and Aaron at Kent State, but it's an important site. Matt has been back. Um, it's where I first started getting ideas about, I just, I've been working on Bob's collection and realized that a lot of these points, especially like this one and this one, not that one, but that one were Indiana hornstone, so they, the church came from southern Indiana, and we're in northern Ohio, and about a third of the material was this Indiana hornstone. So I started understanding trade and movement and all that kind of stuff. But that was pretty cool. Then I went to UT. And I went to UT because I wanted to study animal. I realized while at the museum and trying to do some funnel analysis there that I was never going to be able to figure out on my own because they're just can you tell raccoon toes from dog toes? That's one question I had. I didn't. <laughs> um, the University of Tennessee has an archaeology program. They have over 10,000 animal specimens. And I worked with Dr. Walter Clipple, who's now emeritus. And at that time, emeritus, Dr. Paul Parmley, who's one of the fathers of zooarchaeology, has since passed away, but great people to work with. Not only did I learn skeletal identification, but we did experimental archaeology. Um, this is us. They they called a boar out of the Smoky Mountains uh, National Park, and we got it to learn butchering skills. And we butchered half of it with an axe and half of it with a saw. And there was an old guy, Dr. Clipple, lived in the country. He had a farm. This is my shirt. Love is fleeting. Stone tools are forever. Um, <laughs> and. He, he 
was surprised when Dr. Pipple, he when he grew up, he had grown up with a, another butcher and he was his apprentice and he'd go from farm to farm and they'd butcher things at farm for people. And he was surprised at how much us kids would get involved in cutting all this up and doing this. But, you know, learn how butchering marks look and all that kind of stuff. My undergraduate thesis is related to this site, which is actually in Alabama. This is one JA305. It's up in North East Alabama. It's a huge shell midden excavated in the 70s. I believe that board says 73. Um, one of those sites like sometimes happens in archeology span where everything was excavated, but it wasn't really written up. It's the Widow's Creek site. Um, last few years, there's a big volume that's come out on it. Um, but Darcy Morey was a postdoc student with us, and he was approached to do the animal bone from the site, and I ended up doing the bone tools. So I studied bone tool creation and stuff. I tried to do my best organization of technology, following Phil Carr's methodology or his lineage of analyzing technological stuff. <clears throat> the segue. Huh. While I was at the University of Tennessee, one of my fellow graduate students was Emily Craig, who went on to become the state coroner for the state of Kentucky. She was a forensic artist. She was getting her PhD in bioanthropology and forensics there. She went to a lecture on textiles, mysteries in textiles one day. And she, they talked about the Shroud of Turin. And she had one of those light bulb moments and came up with a plausible way that the Shroud of Turin might have been May. And at the time, they needed some guy with a beard and long hair on it. So that's me. <laughs> yes, I had long hair a beard at the time. I was on Unsolved Mysteries for about eight seconds. Wow. <laughs> and there's, a, there's a coffee table book on Trout and Turn put out by people that propose that the Trout is real. And in it, they talk about Emily's thesis and this picture is in there and in there I am fellow graduate student. I'm very <laughs> honored by it. <laughs> also while at Tennessee, because I was there a while, um, I got involved with Dr. Charlie Faulkner. This book is essays in honor of the Sid for Salem gift shop. Um, Dr. Faulkner recently passed away. Uh, but he was a great mentor, and it's really where I developed my historical archaeology skills. Uh, not only was I assisting him at field schools here, at one point I became resident manager. I did not live in the big house. There was a little cabin. Still got it. But we did a lot of great work there. I think that photo on the far side is actually me standing on the roof of the house I'm living in to take that photo. You know, we found this double flued smokehouse. Um, these posts here were actually part of a large complex compound. The house itself was built in 1797. Indian activity at the time was still very high, so there was a need for some protection. So they built this sort of stockade using buildings in the walls of it. Um, and that was really the first look at that that anybody had ever made. Um, also, large two-story limestone block house was very unusual at the time, kind of greasy and rich. We found some very large posts next to the house where they must have been creating uh, scaffolds so that they could build up this high. I actually dug a hole in the basement. Um, when I left Tennessee in 2001, I thought I would finish a PhD, but I never really did. Um, I ended up going to New Orleans to work for Goodman and Associates there. Um, I was in New Orleans from 2001 to 2015, and I did a lot of work with them. Um, one of the things I never thought I'd say as a terrestrial archaeologist is that I wouldn't be doing things in the water. <laughs> but I got sent out to this site. 
This is 16J2, the second site recorded in Jefferson Parish, Louisiana. It's uh, the Gulf of Mexico is down here, and New Orleans is here. It's somewhere in here. On Bayou St. Dennis, this is a shell midden site, what they call down there chenieres. The places in the, in the marsh where you have trees coming up are almost always sites because it's the only solid land where those trees can grow. And all the white stuff you see is shell from the shell midden. There's a conical mound back here. There's a platform mound in here. Um, BP was building a pipeline through the area. And instead of cutting new channels through the marsh, like many pipeline companies have done, they decided to put the pipeline down by U St. Dennis. And they were coming awfully close to this site. So I got sent out on a work boat with an auger. And I'm augering off the front end of the boat. And we found a human tooth in one of the augers. And that caused problems. So I had to go out and determine if the site was intact. Um, and this was a really interesting project. We shovel tested on land first. Some of our shovel tests started in water, ended in shell midden. There was shell midden down there. Uh, a lot of it looked like that. But the thing was, that by evaluating the whole site, one of the things we had to evaluate was the portion of the site still in the body. Uh, South Louisiana, because the delta is undergoing, it's, it's dropping, I think that's what the word is. So we had to evaluate the portions of the shell midden and the site that were not, that were below the water level in the body. So before gold dredging and gold hunting and discovery channels, gold stuff was a thing. We got a four inch gold dredge from Keen Engineering in Alabama cut a, put together a cookie cutter, what I call a one by one meter test meter cookie cutter, shove it in the bottom of the bayou, and then sucked 20 centimeter levels out with the dredge. The dredge would throw stuff back over this. We had a, a box, you can't really see it here, but there's a yellow string. We had a box that we took the bottom out of, attached the screen to, caught everything that didn't get caught in the louvers of the, the dredge. Um, we excavated seven test units in the water <coughs> and found intact shell mitten in all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, the farthest one offshore was about 10 meters. Had about a three quarters of a meter of water, about a meter of muck, and found intact shell mitten below that. By the end of that one, I was working the nozzle with my feet. Um, so what does that tell you about the age of the showman? I don't know if it's the age of the showman as much as the rate of subsidence. subsidence. Hmm. That was the thing that interested me because a lot of this edge of the shell midden is water eroded shell that's been pushed back and forth by wave action erosion. So it chews it up, makes it smaller. And a lot of that edge of that is all that eroded washed shell. When we hit that, when we were doing units in the water, you could, it, it was immediate because it all just came really fast. It wasn't hard or clunky because it wasn't whole shell. That seven meter unit and a couple of the others that were out there didn't have any wave eroded shell whatsoever. Indicating to me that erosion had happened, or subsidence had happened fairly rapidly. The site dates to 680 years old, um, maybe seven or 800, depending on ceramic interpretations. But one of the other weird things was this is the delta of the Mississippi River. There is no natural stone there whatsoever for stone tools. I took a shovel test at one point and I found these, which are turk pebbles. I asked my crew, had anybody found me before? One or two of them were like, yeah, we did, we did, but it just grabbed them. I'm like, no. The only reason this is here is because humans brought it here. And sure enough, we started finding other stuff. This is one of those pebbles that's been worked by polar loop. So if somebody set it on a rock or something hard and whacked it so that force went both directions on the pebble creating these little flakes to the point where we're finding these little 
tiny chirp drills. And then one day, in one of the test units, we pulled up these big honking pieces of, you know, Cal Stedney, I called it, probably Gulf Coast agate of some kind. Um, but sites in the Delta don't have a lot of rock. There was a site excavated north of us, closer to rock sources, and they excavated 84 square meters and found 24 pieces of rock. In our shovel tests and test units, we had 160. So I don't know what was going on at the site. Everybody's coming along. Everybody's bringing their favorite pebbles and pouch. Um, we had some other stone tools. We had a lot of pottery, French fork in size, and some other stuff. This is a, a red slip larto. Um, bone tools, because other than stone, the other, you know, working tool stuff was stone. This is a uh, conch shell, two of them. This one has been made into a burnisher. I don't know if they were burnishing the inside of pots with it, because this this was angle was there. This is actually a different one, and it's been it's been like carved out so that they took the columella out. But yeah, I never thought I'd wear a wetsuit as an archaeologist. <laughs> Challenging you hear me. Uh, sometime in the spring or fall. It was south of Louisiana. Yeah. We did see some porpoises out in the water. One of my crew members thought they were sharks. <laughs> <laughs> One of the biggest projects I did when I was a good one was the Florida Gas Transmission Phase 8 Expansion Project. Um, we surveyed 580 miles of proposed pipeline from the Alabama-Mississippi border to southern Florida. Um, we had 23 Phase 2 site evaluations and nine Phase 3 data recoveries. USA was involved in this project. I brought them on board to help me with my lithics because... I need to know a lot about rock because most of the sites we excavated here, all of them were prehistoric. I had five sites around the Tallahassee area that were late paleo, early archaic sites. Um, but one of the more interesting sites we did an evaluation of was 8GD106 in Gadsden County, Florida. It was a woodland site and all the little white flags you see are posts for a house. There was a an early archaeologist in Florida had done some work there and decided this was a mound. And because it was a mound, it'd be associated with burials. This was the second time Goodwin and Associates had worked on this site. They worked on it originally in the late 90s when phase three of the Florida gas transmission line went through. And at that time, they had speculated that it may not be a mound, it might be something else. And when they were starting to engineer the actual pipeline in the ground, because of the proximity to the line that was still in the ground next door and all this kind of stuff, they were getting some really crazy machinations of trying to get the engineering right. And so finally, I said, why don't you pay us? We'll go look and see if it's really a mound. So we went out and did a phase two and determined it wasn't a mound. But it was a house. Um, and this was also the, probably the site I had the craziest day on ever with a crew. We had got to Florida in January of 2010 to excavate all these sites. And FGT said, hold on, we don't have permission yet. So two weeks later, we got permission to start work on this site. I had 40 people in the hotel that were really looking for something to do. So we go out there, and I don't have time to prep anything. I've got people standing around wanting to do things. I said, clear all the vegetation from here to 25 feet over. They did that in about five minutes. <laughs> so at some point, I just said, put a unit here on this coordinate, on this direction. And I did that for all those people to get them digging just to get them out of my hair because there's just no way we could get everything set up. So when we finally brought these blocks together, some of the unit sizes were a little odd. But we still did things. And I was running multiple sites at the time. I had this site and two more sites in Tallahassee I was working, and eventually we started working one in the 
Madison, Florida area, and then we had one down in Tampa. One day I was going, this is some of the pottery from that site, some nice stuff, some zone, black and red. One day I was driving between sites, and this is the early cell phone days, and I got a text with this picture attached. I was like, oh Lord, tell me that's not a skull. And then I was like, oh, please tell me that's not at the early paleo or the late paleo, early archaic site. I don't need a whole pot when there aren't supposed to be pots. <laughs> but this was at that same woodland site. And one of the things we know as archaeologists is very rarely do you find a whole pot. And true to form, there's a part of this pot that's missing right here. Yeah. But otherwise, it's all intact. It's actually a frog in the pot. Uh, the top edge is a huge frog, but there's a little lip and a couple of eyes on the top. So, so, you know, about this far below the surface, how it never got totally destroyed, I don't know. Um, but that was pretty cool. I like to use heavy machinery whenever I can, as the folks down in Bay will tell you. We like our heavy machinery. Um, this is the Scarville sugar, uh, sugar Mill. Um, uncovered all of this with a backhoe. We're looking at all the foundations. We found a number of holes that had some large machinery pieces in them. Uh, one of the things I was able to show crews here and demonstrate that roots will always grow to the organic. There were a number of gutters with brick tops in them, and sometimes when those brick tops came off, you could see roots growing right down the middle of them. Um, so this was an interesting project, because I got a cherry picker around. I got to go up in the air, take photos. Um, other things I did at Goodwin and Associates, I don't have any pictures here because I'm not always comfortable with it, but one of those weird projects I ended up doing was a, an ARPA case. I ended up building a Native American burial mound, which I never expected to do as an archaeologist. Northern Louisiana, Madison Parish, there's a National Wildlife Refuge that the local parish was doing a repair on a culvert crossing on a little stream. They had a high water incident, we needed some dirt to make sure things didn't go on their way. So they went over here and borrowed some dirt. Got going with their culvert thing. And a couple weeks later, or a week later, one of the law enforcement guys with the refuge walked by and was like, those are all human remains. <laughs> um, and apparently they used a burial now in their dirt emergency. So we were hired to come in evaluate the damage, excavated units to determine what the cost of the damage scientifically would have cost to do the excavations. And then went into a stage called emergency restoration repair. This culvert crossing was important to this parish, the second poorest parish in the state, um, and it was August. They needed to move across. So I was there for January, no, July 5th to August 23rd. I think I got two days off during all of that. Because uh, then we went into this, I had a team of engineers from the refuge system. We brought in a lot of heavy equipment. We took care of the crossing area to make sure there was going to be no issues with the water or anything. And then basically, Removed all the dirt that might have had human remains in it, created new mounds where all this dirt could go. We put down ground cloth, we put down clean fill, ground cloth. Then we put down all the potential soil that had human remains in them. Then we put more ground cloth over it and then clean fill on top of that. Created two Native American burial mounds. Something I never thought I would participate in. But I don't show pictures of that. When I left Goodwin Associates, I went to back to the Midwest. At one point, working for Ball State in Indiana, I got to go look at a mass dump. <laughs> this was a find in a sewer line, this project. <laughs> um, the sewer line, I was sitting in my office at Ball State and I got a call and the guy's like, what can you tell me about alien biological sites? Is this mastodon, blah, blah, blah. Turns out the construction workers had decided to take this home with them. Even though it was an easement on this gentleman's property, so everything there was his. Um, and other 
most states, including the state of Indiana, paleontological sites are not governed by any jurisdiction at all. Indiana does have laws that govern archaeological sites. And because there was no human activity related to this mastodon forest, uh, there was no criminal recourse. But you can see tusks here. This is the humerus of the mastodon, the upper arm bone. Uh, part of the maxillar, top of the head, with one of the teeth sticking out. It would probably came right through here. And I'm guessing that there were other parts there that the guys didn't recognize. And this is just what was kept by those guys. I got the call on my birthday that I could go out and look at this. And I got out there the next day. And I went out to the location where this was found and didn't realize where I was going at one point. And I walked across the trench that had the new sewer line in it that was filled in and it hadn't settled yet. And I sunk in both feet. <laughs> and I lost a shoe that day. That was the best day to lose a shoe. I didn't care at all. I drove home in bare feet. Because I ain't got the fucking fast <laughs> While at Ball State, I also did some historic archaeology. This is a spring house location uh, behind a historic home. There's a little creek or stream running behind in the greenery here. Um, this pile of rock, we were told, was the foundation of the spring house. They wanted to restore the spring house, so they had to do some archaeology to determine what it looked like. Everybody thought it was going to be a simple three walls and a door. It wasn't. Um, but in the end, what we figured out was that they'd actually cut out the hillside that this was on created land from that cut. These were the actual walls of the spring house and they used the glacial till that was in that cut to create these walls. Leaving me to think that there was a lot of other stuff out on that landform that we hadn't really thought about because it was created land. Um, and this was done in probably 1900, 1910. Um, not at all what we expected to find. There was a split log floor here. Ended up cutting a piece of that out. I'm working with some folks to get dates with that way. That's sort of the view from it, somewhat downhill and all the glacial. I mean, nobody's moving these very far, so they, it had to have come out of that hillside. Um, while at Ball State, Fred Ruby, my friend at Hopewell Culture National Historic Center, called me and asked me to look at some bones. Uh, Hopewell National Historic Center is located near Mound City in Chillicothe, Ohio. And they've done a lot of work in the area around it, a lot of uh, geotechnical stuff, magnetometry. And they've located a number of structures up north, what they call the North 40 at the center. And they excavated around structure one, which is this one, and these are the posts of structure one. It turned out to be a specialty structure. It wasn't a regular habitation. Those are really big posts for a prehistoric structure. And the woman who did the paleobotanical analysis from one of the features said, kind of looks like feasting. It, it had been the most uh, Eastern agricultural complex stuff she'd ever seen come out of a feature. So they asked me to look at the bones. And there were only 220 bones in the feature. Um, 39 of them were deep. And almost all of them, or most of them, were from the front left leg. And you can see in five ulnas, this one is here, this one on the end is for comparison. Five ulnas from the left leg of deers. And each of them, you'll see there's a bone at the top here that's missing from all of these. There's an epiphysis or a fusion point on the end of the ulna, and all of them are unfused. So there are five left legs, from deer that are all about 20 months old. In between some of the pottery and others, some things in there, we think this was a feasting event. Um, and feasting is a weird thing in archaeology. A lot of people use it when they find weird bones or you know, unusual combinations of animal bones. And I, I came up with a feasting continuum. To me, there's two ends of the spectrum on feasting. One is 
the buffet. You go, everybody gets something different. There's a lot of exotic stuff, maybe different stuff. The other end of the continuum is the steakhouse model. Everybody gets good cuts of the same stuff. And I really think this is kind of a steakhouse piece of model. Somebody, and I, I would love for them to do some chemistry on these to see if we can determine if they all came from the same area. Because there's some weird southern pottery in this, this feature. Um, we're finding structure one was used to as a specialty workshop to create five faces and flanks out of Indiana Hornstone that were put with burials at Mount City. So, you know, was this a feast to commemorate the tools that were going to go with the dead and the mounds? But this was this was really cool. I was very thankful Brett called. Mm -hmm. um, since leaving Indiana, I worked for a company located. Our office was in Louisville. I worked all over. But this is Oklahoma. I spent some quality time at the Grand Lake of Cherokees during COVID, um, which is really nice because we were working during the off season of the resort. I got my own cabin with a laundry room, which is amazing. But this is a site we did a phase two on. You can see some folks over here digging holes. One of the points, this is a layer cake feature that we excavated, but this is where we dug several units to, that's about a meter 20 or so. And it's, at that point, OSHA gets upset if you put people in holes that are deeper than a meter 20, you either have to step them out or something. So I put an auger down in the middle of it. And I found artifacts to 4.5 meters below surface. And it wasn't like dirt was falling down. It was solid stuff. And, You'll see there's a channel here, the main channel's over here, and there was another stream coming in here. So I don't know if that was one of those movie fan kind of situations, but they're talking about mitigating. So I don't know what you're gonna do. You gotta dig to China and you gotta either open it all up at the same time or you're gonna get one meter square in the middle of it. Um, yeah. One of the cool things about this was there was chirp everywhere. The bedrock here had interbedded layers of chert. So this is chert, limestone, chert, chert, limestone, chert. And it was really cool. And all the dark bands are chert, white bands are limestone. I really, I bugged Phil about this a lot when I was there, because I'm like, let's just build a fire against the wall of it, and see what spalls out or heat treats or what. Um, Last year in August, I was here. This is Dauphin Island for that company. We were doing some work on the Coast Guard property on Dauphin Island uh, right before Ian. And we pulled out the Saturday before Ian. Um, the most interesting thing we found there was the remnants of a single Union soldier gun placement trench, like a little dug in place to line shoot from. Um, there's also an area of buildings over there that were probably never built based on what we were finding, but the foundations were there and all that kind of stuff. The last big project I had before I came here, I was working with TRC out of New Orleans. I was working on a site in Choctaw County, Alabama. This is 1 CW 364. Uh, the Lumen Pipeline is coming through Choctaw County. And as you can see, we dug fairly deep. This is somewhere between a meter, meter 20 down. Um, the top of it is early woodland, late archaic, a lot of different stem points, getting these kind of rock cluster things. This is three quarters of a, maybe an earth oven kind of thing. Um, but that was about the top 40, 50, 60. The bottom was late archaic, or was early archaic. Um, and we were finding these, these points. I think there's some kind of variation on St. Charles. They're not quite curt. They're not quite things. Um, but we're also finding random large pieces of rock. This is one we found. It's at 100. 11 below datum, so it's probably 120 below surface. 
took it back to the lab, cleaned it off. It's a bunch of nutting stones or a bunch of divots on the top of that stone. Um, but that was pretty cool. And that's it. This is a view from I do have UFOs. I also have I have weird candles in the grass. Too. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions, comments? John, we're thankfully you're not about very long and retired. <laughs> Yes. Um, so at this site in New Orleans, where you had to dig underwater, how many other human remains did you found inside the deep? Found a random handful on the surface in various places, but I had at least one test unit I had to stop digging because, in the words of one of the guys on the workboat we were using, wow, that's a really big bone. Huh? And we had to pull a piece of skull up through the dredge. Um, so we stopped that unit right there. Later on, the Chimash tribe, who were southern area, came back and we buried all of it at the site. But yeah, there was there was probably six or seven pieces total I saw on it. But anything? Yes. I've never found any hole bases. Pots or like historic spaces? Prehistoric. No. Very rarely do you find intact prehistoric vessels. It's just, especially in this eastern United States where we have plowing and everything else, the likelihood of somebody not chunking something is very low. Um, that one I showed is the closest I've ever found to finding a whole prehistoric pot. And I found one I cried because I knew I'd never find another one. <laughs> I was like, that's it. So. <laughs> I take I take that back. I did find that's probably because they were very small. At one point, actually, before I went and built the burial mounds for that ARPA project, I was on an excavation removing burials from a site before it became a reservoir and it's on the eroding edge. And those burials date to about 1658 AD. Each of them had a really small pot at their heads. I think it's just because they were small and it was out in the middle of nowhere that those were intact. Mm -hmm. But that, I guess that's probably the closest. Oh. Anything else? More boring? Less boring? Less boring? Mm -hmm. Yes, Frank. The material of, of all those points uh, showing how someone could just back up the house. It's Tallahatta. Hey, that's oh. what I was going to suggest. Well, yes, it was Tallahatta. In fact, part of the project was to determine if there was a source of Tallahatta that's so listed by still nearby. And apparently, when they did the phase two of the project, the stream that we were next to was really high. And when we got there, there was a beautiful bar of bedrock that was eroding Tallahatta out of it. I did a lot of collecting of Tallahatta. I've had long conversations with Phil about the petrified wood I was finding in the Tallahatta, um, and what he's calling Tallahatta agate, and how I think that's beds of leaves that eventually solidified amongst the Tallahatta. Um, because I I spent a lot of time on that stream looking at the natural processes around it and collecting different amounts of this stuff. We did a I had a flint mapper in Indiana. His name is Vance Bell. He's a retired professor of art at Ball State. Does some really great flint mapping. I loaned him a bucket or so of cobbles, and he did some production strategies for me to talk about production trajectories. But also because he's a he's a sculpture professor and has access to Ball State's kiln, he did some heat treating experiments for me. And we he did a series of about six heat treating experiments. Uh, holding material at different heats for various long various periods of time. I think the longest we held was 700 degrees for 24 hours. And found that heat treating does not do anything for Tallahatta's low sweat It makes it more crumbly, more fragile. Some pretty colors, but it doesn't help its navigability at all. Yes, I'm well. I, 
the University of Tennessee, I was a bones and stones guy. I mean, learning how to nap before I got there, hanging out with Phil and Andrew Bradbury for a long time. I, I definitely understand the lithic stuff as much as I can. Not as much as he can. Anything else? What about your current project? What's interesting about it? Or maybe you yeah, haven't discovered it. There's a lot. <laughs> Um, currently, I'm the historic archaeologist lab director for the Mobile Bay Bridge Project, and there's just lots of stuff, cool stuff. Um, you know, looking at the colonial deposits where we've got French stuff and Native American stuff mixed. In fact, I just sent a poster out to Phil for SEAC next week to talk about the difference between two features at one site where one is clearly colonial and I've got a bunch of fish and turtle and uh, some random other stuff and then I've got a, a later obviously sort of European feature that it's got an electrical insulator in it so it's got to be post around 1900 probably and it's all cow and a little bit of chicken but just the, the variety of materials is pretty incredible you know, I'm fortunate to be here in this place. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sure. <laughs> Here's the signature look now. <laughs>